The theme for today is colliding worlds. And what I'm really going to tell you about is not so much worlds that are going to collide, but sort of fuse, or maybe collaborate, or one informs the other. And let me introduce you to the first world. And that is embryology. And probably the reason why I got involved in science and became a scientist was because I was really fascinated by this problem. The problem of embryology is the following. How do you go from one cell to a multicellular organism? So everyone in this room, at the beginning of your life, you were one cell. And that cell duplicated its DNA and became two. And the two cells divided and became four. And the four eight and the eight sixteen. But when a cell divides, it first duplicates. It makes more copies of its own DNA and other cytoplasmic parts, and it divides. There's no difference between the mother cell and the two daughter cells. The two daughter cells should be identical. So how do cells, when they divide one from the other, how do they become different? That's the problem of embryology. How do you go from one cell to multi cells? So here is a, an embryo, it's a mouse embryo, at 11 and a half days since it was one cell. And look at it, it's got, it's got a brain, a spinal cord, a heart, a liver, a kidney, an eye, an ear, limbs. How does that happen? And I was fascinated by that problem. That problem really took hold in my brain, and it's why I went to graduate school. I wanted to learn about that. And then I sort of focused in on the brain and spinal cord, because thinking of the whole embryo is a very big question. Now, the brain has the same problems. How do you get different types of nerve cells? Forget the problem how you get a nerve cell from a kidney. But how do you, how do you get different types of nerve cells? How do you get motor nerves that control movement and sensory nerves that tell you you're in pain? How do you get that differentiation? But on top of that question, even more fascinating to me was the following problem. How do nerve cells know who to connect to? So the reason why you think, the reason why I think, the reason why I'm able to move is because particular nerve cells are connected to each other. Now, let's think about the size of the problem, because I, I doubt you appreciate it. You have 10 to the 11th nerve cells in your brain and spinal cord. 10 to the 11th is too big to think about. It's 100,000 million. Okay? So what I usually tell my students is imagine a, a stack of loonies, a million. And I give, a, I give you 100,000 of those stacks. That's how many nerve cells are in your brain and spinal cord. And now imagine that you blow those loonies all over the room. And now that loony has to communicate with that one and no other. Somewhere in my motor cortex in my brain, there is one particular motor nerve that sends a fiber all the way down my spinal cord and it finds a nerve cell in my spinal cord and that that nerve cell sends a fiber out to my muscle so I can move my finger. Well, in the embryo, how did it ever grow down? It can grow feet. It's a thin little process. And it goes all the way down. It ignores all the other 10 to the 11th possible targets until it finds the right target, makes a connection, and so I can move, I can talk, etc. That's the problem of the wiring of the nervous system. And it's interesting in that it's the same in each one of us. We all have the same wiring pattern. It's not by chance. And in fact, the same wiring pattern can be found all the way through the animal kingdom. I was fascinated by that. When I came to Western, I set up my lab and I had the good fortune to have the lab uh, right adjacent to a colleague of mine who was a very generous and, and great mentor, Dr. Lynn Weaver. And Lynn sort of took me under her wing, it's a few years ago before I had any gray in the beard. And Lynn took me under her wing and let me join her lab meetings as a, as a young faculty member, it was important, and she wanted to tell me about her science and what she was involved in. And Lynn was involved in a totally different area of work. She was looking at spinal cord injury. 
And, and here you can see a, a injured spinal cord. I don't think I have a point on this, maybe I do. I do, does it work? Yes, it does. So you can see a spinal cord here, and you can see the vertebrae, and you can see, unfortunately, in this person, the C6 vertebrae is protruding into the spinal cord. So here's the spinal cord, and it's damaging the nerve cells. This person's gonna have a lot of troubles. Right? That's what spinal cordial injury looks like. And Lynn was explaining it to me, and I couldn't help but in a very simple way ask the following question. If in the embryo, nerve cells know how to grow from the brain all the way down the spinal cord and find a target, why don't they just do that again in the injured spinal cord? What is wrong? It knows how to do this as an embryo. We don't forget how to ride the bike. Why don't those nerve cells just reactivate the genetic program and re regrow? Now, when I, went to, uh, when I went to undergrad, we were told that while peripheral nerves can grow if they're damaged, so if you cut a nerve in your finger, it will regrow, nerves in the CNS, the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, don't. That was sort of dogma. In a moment, we'll talk about why and whether or not that's true. But let's first of all talk about what the nervous system can do. So here I'm showing you an MRI just to get you used to looking at a brain. Okay, it's a, it's a coronal section, so what we mean is you're looking dead on the person, right, at my face. And you can see on the outside is the skull, just to make sure we're all seeing the same thing, right there, the skull, the brain is sitting inside. Um, you can just appreciate the, the right-left symmetry. The brain has a lot of symmetry in it. We talked about brain cells already, so those are the sort of the gray areas here. I think I can trace it out, there we go. And you see the whiter spots? Those are all those connections that I told you were so important. Lots of connections. So I want you to get used to this, you've all seen it, and you're all now neuroradiologists. You're all gonna be able to tell me what's wrong with the patient that I'm about to show you an MRI of. Keep this in mind, and diagnose. Yeah, it doesn't take long. You don't have to be too schooled to say that there's something wrong, right? This person's okay, okay? This is, what, this is the result of a medical intervention. This, was a, uh, this is a seven-year-old patient who was given a hemispherectomy, so literally one hemisphere of the brain was removed because they had intractable epilepsy. And it was a, it's, a, it's an intervention of last resort. Nothing would stop the seizures. And you would think, though, that this person would have lots of problems. You've removed their speech center. You've removed the control of movement on the left side of her body. Let's see how she actually was. This is from Lancet. And you can see, it says there in the middle, uh, you know, uh, though the dominant hemisphere was removed with its control centers and the motor control for the left side of the body, the child is fully bilingual in Turkish and Dutch. And even her hemiplegia is recovered and is only noticeable by a slight spasticity of her left arm and leg. You can be missing half your brain. You can have one of your hemispheres can be gone. And I gotta say, if you're young enough, you can show remarkable level of recovery. Why is that possible? The only explanation is that the healthy part of the brain rewires and compensates for the loss function. So let's turn our attention to what my lab was interested in. So from, from Dr. Weaver, I learned a lot about spinal cord injury, and I was attacking it from the point of view of why, don't it, why doesn't it rewire? So here you see an injured spinal cord. The injury is in the middle, right about here. And you can see the nerves marked in, in green here. Those are the, the, the processes from nerve cells that are in the brain that were connected below the lesion, and then when the lesion happened, they retracted up. And they can't grow through the lesion. And one of the stories in this field is that the reason why they don't grow through the lesion is because the lesion becomes plugged up with scar tissue. And the scar tissue, the type of molecule it's called, and I can't, I apologize for the sciencey term, sciencey term, but it's a chondroitin sulfate proteoglycan. 
We'll just call them CSPGs. These are the same proteins that you find when you cut yourself and you get a scar. Makes up the scar. It's the same types of proteins that you find in your cartilage. It's a matrix protein, extracellulose. And the amazing thing, unfortunately, is that CSPGs block nerve growth. Now, one could devise a strategy then to, to improve growth through the lesion if you could get rid of these pesky CSPGs. But then there's a difficult truth. And the difficult truth is shown here. And that is that we find that these CSPGs, these repulsive, nerve-repelling molecules, are not just found in the scar, but they are found throughout the nervous system. About 50% or more of your nerve cells, and here I'm showing you a nerve cell in green, 50% of them have this net of CSPGs, of these repulsive molecules around them. They're marked here in red around the green nerve cell. Why does it look like a net? It's because they, the connections are in the holes. Okay. But it really makes very little sense. Why would you have nerve-repelling molecules surrounding nerve cells? And then you got to think of the embryo. This is what we think happened in the embryo. So here we have some cartooned nerve cells. And they're going to connect up to this nerve cell up here. And they do so. And they do so in the absence of CSPGs. But the nervous system, once it, it wires, it then makes these CSPGs, shown here in red. And the reason for that is, once you've wired the nervous system, you don't want to constantly be rewiring the nervous system. Right? Once it's formed. So there's a very strong growth signal in the embryo to wire. But then, just like everything else in nature that has a, a positive signal, or every yin has a yang, every positive needs a negative, you need a signal to stop growth, or else you constantly be rewiring your nervous system, and you never have the stability that you need. Now imagine you have CSPG. Uh, imagine that you have a, a spinal cord injury, and now you've lost the inputs. Now this nerve cell no longer has enough inputs for it to be active. And there's all these CSPGs in the way, even at the scar where the lesion happened. But now, imagine that you could block CSPGs, stop them from being made. In that case, you have less CSPGs, and now you can get sprouting. This guy could sprout. and you could get more inputs, and even this other nerve cell might be able to sprout onto it. So the idea then is we know how it happens in the embryo. Can we trick the adult injured spinal cord to thinking it's an embryonic case and shut down its CSPG production and allow for greater growth? So we tried that. Um, and the way in which we did this is we asked the following question. We asked, what controls CSPG production in in, in, in the animal once they, or in a person once, once they're injured. And we identified a particular gene, a particular protein that says make CSPGs, make these genes. And so we could, we could through genetic ma manipulation, make a mouse that couldn't express SOX9. SOX9 is the name of this controlling protein, the one that says, let's make CSPGs, directs the others. And so we could knock it out. And when you do that, what we're showing you here is that when you take, when you take out SOX9, took it out about 70%, all these other proteins, and those are the CSPGs, go down. And if we look at the, how the animals recover after spinal cord injury, this is looking at their, grow, at their walking. This is time after injury. This is how much coordination they have how much they use their back limbs that are now paralyzed. And you can see that the ones that don't have SOX9, that have less of those CSPGs, they do a lot better than the controls. And on the other side of the slide, I'm showing you how much total movement, right? If we take a look at these animals, here's a spinal cord injured animal. Within about an hour, it travels very little. 
compared to an uninjured animal. But the SOX9 knockouts, if you stop that controlling gene that says make CSPGs, it walks around as much as the uninjured animal. Let me show you what it looks like in stroke. Different model of injury, but the same idea. If an animal has had a stroke and we block its SOX9, we see something amazing happen. Some of the connections in the brain for motor function are same-sided. So there's a motor neuron here in your motor cortex that goes to an area called the red nucleus. And it's same-sided, the right side to the right side. And what happens when you've had a left-sided stroke? This red nucleus on the left side has no input. And what do we find happens? We find this. That inputs from this right side now go to the left. If we look on the other side, this is showing a different type of connection. This is from the motor cortex in the brain all the way down the spinal cord. And now in this case, it goes to the opposite side. So the right side goes to the left. And if you do a SOX9 knockout, you stop the CSPGs, you'll find that this nerve cell not only innervates the left side, but sprouts into the right. Somehow it senses the absence of that input and it makes up for it. So it's kind of like you've, you've, you're an electrician and you've wired a house. And you have, you have lights on the main floor where the living room and the dining room are. You have lights in the bedroom level and even in the attic. And now imagine that one of, one of the wires gets cut so you no longer have lights in your living room, dining room level. The amazing thing about the brain is that a, 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 the wire on the bedroom level senses that the living room is dark. And it grows its own fiber, and it turns on the light. That's what your brain can do. Because there's almost always going to be spared tissue. And the healthy tissue can rewire and compensate for the damage. That happens as a normal process. And what we're working on through SOX9 is trying to just enhance that by decreasing the CSPGs that normally limit that process. And just in short, so we try to take what we know genetically, we're now doing drug discovery, and eventually we hope to, do, to find a SOX9 inhibitor that could be brought into the human condition. Finally, in my last 35 seconds, I want to thank the people that do the work. So uh, all my work has been, this work has been done uh, in my lab. It began many years ago with Paul Griss. He was a PhD student in my lab and is now a scientist in Montreal. Uh, Monty McKillop was a PhD student in my lab and is now a scientist in Wisconsin. This is a picture of my current lab, Makeup. And I, I really want to point out the top three. So Nicole Jeremia, Todd Hersu, and Kathy Zhu, they are the nucleus of my lab. They've been with me each for longer than a decade, and, and they're why we, we, we get things done. My current crop of students, Natalie Osowski, Corey Fletcher, and Tony Liu, uh, thank you for your attention.